Uh, right now, though, I want to welcome to the program editor of Guns and Patriots at uh, Human Events, Mr. Neil McCabe. Neil, how you doing tonight, sir? Phenomenal, Cam. Uh, good to be with you. Excellent. Glad that uh, you could come along, and you've got a, uh, a great column today. It is hard to believe, but it is now uh, one year since Fast and Furious came undone. You point out that to tomorrow, December 14th, will be the one-year anniversary of the murder of Border Patrol agent Brian Terry, and it was a year ago today that uh, KRI-TV in Houston uh, reported on the uh, lawyer for Carter's country uh, 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 saying that agents from BATFE actively encouraged uh, Carter country employees to sell guns to suspected straw purchases, and in some cases over their objections and their reluctance. Yeah, it's, what's crazy, Cam, is, you know, it was all out there, you know, uh, both uh, Napolitano and Holder, within within a week of, uh, of Terry's murder, they had all of the facts, all the guns were traced, traced uh, to Fast and Furious, all of the suspects were arrested, and then you had uh, Carter Country's attorney basically spilling the whole story, and yet, you know, frankly... I blew it, and I think like a lot of people, just didn't see it coming. Who would have believed it, really, Cam? Yeah, no, I, I, I know. I mean, you know, when it, it when you, you go back to uh, like February, when uh, the, you know, in late January, when the stories were were first starting to break, uh, and we really had no idea of of the scope of this story and how big and involved that it would get. I mean, if you had told me. Back on February the 7th, when John Dodson gave his first interview, uh, the ATF whistleblower agent to uh, Cheryl Atkinson of CBS, that that at the end of this year, not only would we still be discussing new developments in Fast and Furious, but that the Justice Department would be refusing to turn over uh, really any more information about Fast and Furious to the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, that words like impeachment uh, would have been used, congressional contempt would have been used. I, I, I'm not sure I would have believed you. It's funny, too, that uh, who would have believed that the Justice Department would actually withdraw formal letters that it sent to congressional committees and basically said this letter is no longer operative because we lied. And we're just going to take that letter back now. <laughs> right. Right. But no, they didn't lie. They just had inaccurate information. It wasn't false. Well, no, no. Actually, actually what the, you know, you're, you're very good to correct me because <laughs> what they consistently do is they always answer the wrong question but in absolute terms yeah no that's that's a great point uh in fact we saw that from uh, eric holder uh quite a bit last week when he was uh, testifying before the uh, house judiciary committee uh, now you get into the the you know really the early days before uh public knowledge of fast and furious came out after border patrol agent brian terry uh was murdered and you say within 24 hours of terry's death federal officials had traced the guns that were recovered to the scene uh, too Fast and Furious. Behind the scenes, ATF and other federal agents aware of the gunwalking program called Operation Fast and Furious staged a mutiny and the operation was shut down. In the next week, though, you point out, Holder goes to uh, Arizona for the funeral. Right. Janet Napolitano goes to Arizona to meet with members of uh, Terry's Special Tactics Unit. Both of them, uh, who knew about or at least were aware of Fast and Furious, knew that uh, uh, Terry had been killed. Uh, with a uh, gun sold as part of Fast and Furious. You say they were both fully briefed on Fast and Furious, uh, and though the operation was still a secret, they had both touted in public speeches. The overall program, uh, it was a part of called Operation or Project uh, uh, Gunrunner. Now, a whole, you know, Holder has, has denied knowing anything about uh, Fast and Furious right up until uh, the time that the, uh, the first media reports came out. It defies credulity. I mean, really. I mean, it's absolutely absurd. I mean, I've spoken to ATF agents who have confirmed to me that he was briefed, um, and it and it it sort of a, it, it doesn't even make sense that the attorney general would show up and that he wouldn't be told. I mean, we can just assume that on a casual basis mm -hmm. that if they knew this. Um, but I but ATF people have told me that Holder was briefed when he showed up to the funeral. You know, and 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 uh, Janet Napolitano, when she was testifying before Congress recently, uh, 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 said that when she went out there, the uh, the ballistics tests had not been concluded, and so she didn't learn anything about Fast and Furious. Now we know that that's not the case, as you say. Within 24 hours, uh, the guns there at the scene had been traced back to Fast and Furious. I find it again very hard to believe that uh, Napolitano would not have been briefed or would not have even asked the simple question: So where do the guns come from? Especially when you consider that uh, that Gunrunner was such a big 
project that they had conferences in Mexico City. Both uh, both uh, Holder and Napolitano had given speeches. They had conferred with Mexican officials. Uh, when you consider that they used stimulus money to open new gun runner offices down on the uh, Mexican border, this was a huge, huge project that they were touting in press releases. And the key to the whole project, of course, was Fast and Furious. It's just nobody knew about it because it was behind the scenes. Yeah, and so, you know, here we are a year later. Uh, and as yeah. I said, you know, the internal investigation, I mean, for, you know, never mind the congressional investigation, DOJ's internal investigation uh, is not been concluded. And, and really, uh, the attorney general didn't give any indication that it would be uh, finished anytime soon. H- how much longer do you think the investigations into Fast and Furious are going to continue, Neil? Well, the, uh, you know, when they, uh, a bunch of uh, President Johnson's aides were convinced that uh, Jagger Hoover was a poisonous presence in Washington and that Hoover should be fired. And Johnson refused to fire him because he said, I would rather have him inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in. And uh, that seems that that sort of philosophy seems to have carried over to today's Department of Justice because all of the key players, the on the ground commanders, the oversight people, They've all been sort of shuffled around, but they all still have their jobs. A lot of them have been promoted, and basically, uh, you know, they have no incentive to come clean. They certainly have no incentive to be whistleblowers. Mm-hmm. So who knows? Who knows if they're just going to ride this thing out? Well, I, you know, the, the interesting thing is if they want to try to ride it out, they've got to rely on a complicit media to continue burying the stories. I mean, and, and we've seen it. You've pointed it out. Uh, the Washington Post coverage of Fast and Furious has been absolutely abysmal. Uh, I think when Holder testified last week, the, uh, the the story ended up on page A25 on the uh, federal page, and about half of the story was dedicated not even to Fast and Furious, but to Eric Holder talking about uh, uh, Obamacare. Well, I, you know, I've been uh, I've been more aggressive than a lot of other people in linking the Washington Post with this story. Uh, and I think that's, you know, we actually talked about it the last time you had me on. But, you know, I think that the Washington Post, you know, the fact that their reporters were wear, working hand in glove with the ATF and the amount of information and the kind of documents that uh, that the ATF gave the Washington Post, including an interrogation video. I mean, if you have I mean, if you've worked in any kind of law enforcement or military, any kind of government thing, the idea that that you could get your hands on an interrogation video and then you could just release that to the public, yet the Washington Post had that. The Washington Post put out another video that was a companion of this piece that was narrated by an ATF agent. And so it, it literally you had ATF agents in the production studio working with the Washington Post to put out this story. Yeah, no, you make an excellent point. And, you know, um, interestingly enough, I mean, in the early days of the, uh, the, the, the coverage of Fast and Furious, um, that team of investigative reporters, Sari Horwitz uh, among them, w- w- you know, they were the ones that were actually writing about Fast and Furious and never, ever once did they talk about their role in, in trying to, you know, s- make it appear as if the, the gun dealers, the gun sellers in, at, at, uh, at the heart of their stories uh, were in fact working with the ATF. They never informed the public of this. Well, the, the gun stores that they uh, that they turned in that sort of uh, that top ten list where uh, Carter Country is actually listed twice, mm-hmm. uh, two different stores. I mean, all of those statistics, everything came from Fast and Furious. And if you're familiar with any of these sort of in the with the laws governing these kind of statistics, the ATF is not allowed to give out. Uh, these sort of um, they they're allowed to track the guns and who sold the guns. They're not allowed to release that information by uh, only to. They're only allowed to release it to investigators or law enforcement. They're, it's not. They're not supposed to release it with uh, by if it's requested by Freedom of Information Act. That's a. It's kind of a crazy way I'm spitting it out. And so my point is that either the Washington Post stole the information or someone illegally gave it to them mm. because by law, these statistics are not supposed to see the light of day unless it's part of a legitimate criminal investigation. And in that case, it actually goes to a law enforcement agency. Interesting. 
Hey, uh, Neil, we're, we're almost yes, out of sir. time here, but uh, you know, where, where do you see this story going? We were talking with Representative Farenhold, who's a member of the uh, House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, uh, earlier in the program. And, you know, it certainly seems like uh, members of that committee are, are very interested in any emails uh, from the attorney general related to Fast and Furious. Holder was asked about that when he appeared before the uh, House Judiciary Committee, and he never gave a straight answer as to whether or not he had written any emails, whether on his governmental uh, account or on a private account, uh, dealing with this operation. Well, I mean, there's no way of proving it. Uh, you know, I've been told that uh, Holder and other people in the White House were blind copied. Uh, you know, it would really, you know, I would love, you know, Tom Cruise to get the Mission Impossible team and get those Outlook files. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, really right now, it feels to me like sort of Watergate 1973. And so it's like, you know, in, in, in 1973, even Nixon knew he was cooked. It was just a matter of time. Uh, the you know, eventually this thing is going to break through, so it's no longer sort of a – it's a story in the beltway. It's a story with the gun rights community. Eventually it's going to break through, and then, and then it'll take on a momentum of its own. And so we just got to keep pushing. Shows like yours, uh, at gunsandpatriots.com, we're just going to comp- continue to uh, drill this down. All right, Neil. Glad you could be with us on the program, sir. Thanks again, and uh, we'll talk to you very soon. All right, absolutely. Take care, Cam. All right, Neil McCabe joining us, uh, editor of Guns and Patriots at uh, Human Events.